Way back in 2013, Edward Snowden released NSA documents showing that the government was spying on internet traffic. One of the many things these documents suggested was that the NSA is able to decrypt VPN communications at scale, thereby breaking network encryptions that most security researchers considered secure. What the leaked documents did not show was exactly how this decryption was done. By now, you have heard various stories of how intelligence agencies paid hardware companies to install backdoors on their products. But in 2014, a group of researchers suggested the NSA might have done something much more impressive. At least more impressive from a cryptographic perspective. They suggested that the NSA might have broken the actual mathematical foundation that underlies some of the more popular secure communication protocols based on Diffie-Hellman key exchange. The authors claim they found evidence which, quote, suggests NSA may already be exploiting 1024-bit Diffie-Hellman to decrypt VPN traffic. Even though the research is a couple of years old by now, it forms a great backdrop to introduce various common cryptographic building blocks that I want to discuss on this channel, including one-way functions, the discrete logarithm problem, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and just a little bit of index calculus. So let's dive in. Starting with the basics, a typical secure communication consists of two phases. In the first key exchange phase, both parties agree on the encryption keys used in the second actual communication phase. The challenge is to agree on a secret value while someone might be listening in. The solution is to use so-called one-way functions. A one-way function is easy to compute in one direction, but it's very difficult to reverse. As a textbook toy example, we could call the mixing of two colors of paint a one-way function, since it is very difficult to split mixed paint back into the two original colors. If we have a publicly agreed base color, we can first let person A pick a secret random color, mix it with the base color and send it to person B. Person B will then do the same thing with their own secret random color. An eavesdropper cannot reverse the mixtures and does not learn what the randomly selected colors were. Now A and B each add their secret color to the mixture they received from the other person. Both will end up with the same final mixture which cannot be created by the eavesdropper. Therefore this mixture can be used as a secret key to encrypt the rest of their communication, although I will leave it to your imagination as to how that would work in practice in this paint example. The only way for the eavesdropper is to go through all possible colors until they find one of the mixtures they intercepted. In the mathematical counterpart of this analogy, this kind of brute force decryption costs a lot of time, possibly years, and a lot of money. The attacker needs to store all the encrypted communication that follows in order to decrypt it later, and they have to hope that the decrypted information will still be relevant months or years after it was communicated. Assuming that the one-way function is sufficiently hard to reverse, this is not worth the effort for even a single communication, let alone the likely many communications that an attacker is interested in. However, in this 2014 paper, the researchers showed that there was a way to pay a steep initial startup cost only once and then decrypt any connection in just a few minutes or less. To be precise, the article demonstrates an attack on only one of the many key establishing protocols, namely those using Diffie-Hellman over finite fields. The authors attack the 512-bit version of this particular protocol and go on to claim that an attack on the 1024-bit version could break 66% of VPN servers, 18% of the top million HTTPS domains and 26% of SSH servers. A claim that has been later refuted by some, but we will ignore that in this video. But before you get overly concerned, you should know that today, in 2021, this 1024-bit version is found in 0% of SSH servers. The one-way or paint mixing function in this protocol is exponentiation in a finite field and the supposedly hard reverse or paint unmixing is computing the discrete logarithm. There, we already got to say the words in the title of this video and we're only one third of the way in. To understand this discrete logarithm, let's see what we remember of regular exponentiation and logarithms. Exponentiation, written as g to the power a, means multiplying the number g a times with itself. The logarithm is the reverse of this operation. 
the logarithm of x with base g answers the question how often do I have to multiply g with itself to obtain x. There are various ways to compute the logarithm, such as Taylor's series or Newton's method, and I'm not going to go into details of these methods, but it's important to note that they rely on the fact that the logarithm can be approximated. What I mean by this is that if I want to answer the question what is the logarithm of 6 with base 2, I know that the answer lies somewhere between 2 and 3. Because 2 to the power 2 is 4, 2 to the power 3 is 8, and 6 is in between 4 and 8. I could improve my approximation by computing 2 to the power 2.5, I see it's 5.66 which is less than 6, so now I know the answer lies somewhere between 2.5 and 3. In other words, these algorithms rely on the monotonicity of exponentiation. That is, if a is greater than b, then g to the power a must also be greater than g to the power b, and vice versa. In practice, computers will use lookup tables to compute logarithms, but also that is something we can and will ignore in this video. This all changes if, instead of regular numbers, we put the problem in the domain of finite fields. To learn about finite fields, you really should watch my previous upload, but for this video it's sufficient to understand it as follows. We only keep all integer values between 0 and some prime number. Whenever we add, subtract or multiply two values, we keep adding or subtracting this prime number until we have a value back in our set, also known as taking the value modulo p. The vision is special, but we don't have to worry about it today. The important thing is that multiplication still works, therefore so does exponentiation. But what if you want to compute the logarithm? Since we have a finite set of numbers, our past assumption of monotonicity no longer holds. For example, consider a finite field where we take the integers modulo 13. The number 3 is smaller than 4, but 2 to the power 3 modulo 13 is 8, while 2 to the power 4 is 16 which modulo 13 is 3. So the 2 to the power 3 is not smaller than the 2 to the power 4. In other words, known algorithms for regular logarithm, which all rely on this monotonicity property, no longer work in the setting where we have a discrete finite set of numbers. In fact, there are no known algorithms that can compute a logarithm in every finite field in an efficient manner. We can now see how the discrete logarithm can power a key exchange protocol known as Diffie-Hellman, named after its creators, Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman, who published the protocol in 1976. Two parties first publicly agree on a common value g and a prime number p. They then each pick a secret number a and b and send g to the power a or b modulo p to each other. Because there is no known way to reverse these exponentiations for an eavesdropper who only knows g and p, they cannot learn the values of a or b. However, the parties can take the received value and again raise it to the power of a or b. We see that effectively both parties have now multiplied g with itself a total of a times b times. This resulting value can now be used to secure the rest of the communication. Since this is only secure assuming that the discrete logarithm computation cannot be performed efficiently, we say that this protocol is secure under the discrete logarithm assumption. So if there are no known algorithms which can compute the discrete logarithm in every finite field in an efficient manner, then what is the problem? The issue is with the quantifier every finite field. There are in fact some algorithms that can solve the problem somewhat efficiently or even very efficiently in particular scenarios. To give you some intuition, say I asked you how much is 654,327 divided by 7. This is not a question you can answer quickly without the use of a calculator. However, if I asked you to do the almost exact same thing, namely tell me how much is 700,000 divided by 7 you can answer me straight away. Neither the operation nor the magnitude of the numbers involved has changed, but the second setting is clearly much easier. A somewhat similar issue exists for the discrete logarithm, 
when choosing the prime value used in creating the finite field. So to avoid accidentally picking a number where the discrete logarithm can be computed more easily than intended, most applications rely on someone else, some authority, telling them what numbers are safe to use. In fact, the researchers show that, at the time, 92% of the world's 1 million most popular web pages which support 512-bit Diffie-Hellman used just two different prime values. Still, the exponential base G is different for each connection, which means that there are many different bases to choose from, so there is no real disadvantage in everybody using the same prime number. Right? It turns out that some of these somewhat efficient algorithms can take advantage of the fact that everyone is using a field based on the same prime number. In particular, an index calculus algorithm named the number field sieve. Explaining the full algorithm and its many improvements goes well beyond the scope of this video, but the reasoning behind it can be summarized as follows. In the following, all computations happen modulo p. I will also use some common properties for composite numbers and logarithms that I will not explain further to keep this explanation at least somewhat short. If you want to know more, have a look at the links in the description. We want to compute the logarithm of h for base g. The properties of the logarithm tell us that we can choose any other base a and compute this as the logarithm a of h divided by the logarithm a of g. So if we solve the discrete logarithm problem for just one base a, we can compute it for any value of g. To compute log a of h or log a of g for that matter, we rewrite the term as follows. First, we use the fact that every number can be expressed as a product of prime numbers. This is also known as the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. For example, 20 can be expressed as 2 times 2, which is 4, times 5. 27 can be expressed as 3 to the power 3, and 7 is just the prime number 7. So, we replace h with its factorization into primes. Then, we apply the rule that the logarithm of x times y is the same as the logarithm of x plus the logarithm of y. And finally, we also apply the rule that the logarithm of x to the power y is the same as y times the logarithm of x. Again, if you want to understand why these properties are true, please follow the links in the description. Now, we no longer need to compute the log a of all numbers, but just the log a of prime numbers. Also, g and h are no longer involved in these terms, so these logarithms can be pre-computed as long as we know the prime p, which is exactly the situation we see in the practical use of Diffie-Hellman key exchange, where many instances reuse the same finite fields. To compute these logarithms, we use an approach known as sieving. We pick a random number v and compute w as a to the power of v. So we know that v is the log a of w, and similar as we did for log a of h, we can rewrite log a of w in terms of the log a of prime numbers. This gives us a rather simple linear relation where the unknown values are the log a's of prime numbers. To make this more explicit, I am writing the log a of a prime number as L2, L3, L5, and so on. We then continue to generate many such linear relations. Once we have more relations than unknowns, that is, the log a's of prime numbers, we essentially just have a set of linear equations that we can solve to learn the value of log a for these prime numbers. If you are not familiar with linear algebra, you can have a look at one of my older videos. And that's it on a very high level. We can pre-compute the log a of many prime numbers and store them in a database. Then, when we want to compute the log g of h, we can rewrite them as a combination of log a of prime numbers and build up the solution from the logarithms stored in our database. In practice though, the story is much more involved. The exact value we pick for a heavily influences not only how fast we can create enough linear relations to solve log a for prime numbers, 
but also whether the log A of G and H exists in the first place. For example, if P is 11 and we pick A to be 10, the only numbers that can be created with the exponentiation of A are 10 and 1. Also, we are talking about very large numbers, so generating enough linear relations to get a solvable matrix can take very long. Additionally, we are not likely to get a log A for all prime numbers, so a technique known as descent needs to be applied on values G and H to map them into a value that can be factorized into those prime numbers. There are many tricks and optimizations used in practical number field sieve implementations, but all of these go well beyond the scope of this video. The researchers in the paper implemented exactly this approach for the two 512-bit keys shared by so many web servers. For each key, they spent about one week running the parallelized pre-computation on up to 3000 CPU cores to create a 2.5 GB database of known logarithms. With it, they were able to run the last step of actual computing the discrete logarithm of an intercepted Diffie-Hellman key exchange in, on average, 70 seconds. Estimated on internet-wide scans, the article shows that many web servers, IPsec VPN servers and SSH servers do share common prime values for 1024-bit security as well. The authors then continue to provide some pretty rough back-of-the-envelope estimates to show that it would cost about $100 million to perform the same attack on 1024-bit security. Pointing out that this is well within the $10.5 billion budget of the US Consolidated Cryptologic Program which covers the NSA, the authors suggest that this may be the way in which the NSA is breaking the encryption of commonly used VPN protocols. While it remains debatable whether the NSA has actually been applying this particular attack on encrypted traffic, it is clear that the widespread use of the same prime numbers dramatically weakens the security that we expect our encryption to provide. The authors of the paper point out that it would be good if theoretical cryptographers and practical system builders could get more involved in each other's field, to avoid such an intentional reduction of security in the future. The article finishes with, quote, Bridging the perilous gap that separates these communities will be essential for keeping future systems secure. Perhaps this video is doing its own little part to help with that. To keep your connection secure, it makes sense to use a modern VPN server. If you sign up for NordVPN today and use sign up code CryptoClear, you will receive no reduction in price because they do not sponsor this channel. See you next time.